Good morning, everyone. So today I've got 25 minutes and we're going to focus on this particular topic, ethics considerations in clinical trials of vaccines. Oh. Maybe I'm not doing this. Ah, oh, all right. So the goals for the talk is to examine several ethical complexities in trials, not every single one. So we're going to dip into certain complexities. I'd really like to try and flag for you and identify certain resources that I think are extremely helpful. They help you to think about things differently and maybe develop a set of associated practices. These range from the very abstract in the form of ethical principles, all the way through to the very granular and concrete in the form of empirical data on some of these issues. So there's a whole range. Some of you will work closely with ethics in your day jobs. So you may have sat on an ILB, you may have developed a protocol submission and worked on that ethics consideration section. And if that's the case, then all I can hope for is that this adds an additional set of tools to your existing database about the ethics. But for many of you, you may never brush up much in your day jobs in the ethics of clinical trials. It may not be something that's close to your, your lived experience, if you like. And if that's the case, then the goal for the course, the goal for the talk is really just to help you to prepare for the case study that you will have at the end of the morning, where we're going to ask you to all become an, an IRB or a research ethics committee and uh, come up with some justified recommendations on some very tricky issues. So hopefully that'll make it more interesting and just a lot more informative and fun for you. So most of you will know that research ethics tries to adjudicate between the claims, the rights, the welfare of participants, uh, enrolled participants in trials in the here and now, but also another group, and that's the, the hypothetical beneficiaries of knowledge and interventions um, in, the, in the future. And it's really the trying to adjudicate between the, the claims of both of those two groups. And that's what makes it complex. Not impossible, but complex. Gosh. Okay. So... Um, very briefly, what is the context for vaccine studies? I'm certainly not going to read all of these, but I'm just going to leave them for you as notes. Um, there are a whole lot of ingredients that make um, vaccine studies complex. If you, oh, all right. Apologies. Context. So if you just look at the, um, the one in italics. So there are probably 45 different countries represented in this room. And each of those settings will have a matrix of laws and guidelines and policies that regulate research with human participants. And that can make uh, international trials complex. They also, the, the host settings themselves will have a rich and diverse, different socio-political and cultural context. No two settings will be the same. If you look at the other um, uh, in the italicized sentence, participants enrolled in these studies often have vulnerabilities. In my view, one of the best definitions of vulnerability, and there are many, is that vaccine participants have some feature either internally, so it's in, inter, intrapersonal or interpersonal or even structural, some feature that either complicates the informed consent or it increases the risk of harm. Um, and obviously in vaccine studies, participants may definitely bring vulnerabilities. Community stakeholders may as well. If you look at the bullet at the bottom, I'm not claiming that these ingredients are unique to vaccine studies. And you've probably worked in other areas, other disease conditions, for example, you may, these may resonate with you. Um, so it's not that they're unique to studies, it's that many of them are present in vaccine studies. Right, so the first set of resources available to you, and you've probably seen these in your own domestic guidelines. So if you look at the guidelines that are for human participants in your setting, they'll often start off with a statement like this. It might not be identical, slightly different formulation, and there may be additional principles that are considered really important in your setting that they'll add. But these are the sort of the big four, and I know you might know them all, but I'm just going to go through them very, very briefly 
regardless. So the first is respect for autonomy, and this is that vaccine res researchers must respect the freedom of thought and action of vaccine participants, but it's two part. Where participants have vulnerabilities, they may need to implement special steps or take special steps. The second is beneficence. The common formulation here is that vaccine researchers need to anticipate the potential harms and then take steps just to mitigate them or reduce those harms. And they also need to consider what the potential benefits might be and take steps to maximize those. And remember the sweet spot is that there will be sufficiently minimized and sufficiently outweighed risks. So at the end of the day, a vaccine study, what the formula you're looking for is where the risks have been sufficiently minimized and they're offset by some sound compensatory reason, either a direct benefit to participants, but generally to society and knowledge gains. So but that's the that's the, the, the real crux of, of vaccine research. Um, the former are usually usually operationalized in terms of informed consent. The second one in, in the idea that there should be an adequate risk-benefit ratio. In terms of justice, there are many formulations. The one that you will commonly hear of in research ethics is distributive justice, and that's that there should be a fair allocation or spread of the risks and benefits amongst all the collaborating parties, and that those people that are, uh, who assume the risks and the burdens should be able to access the benefits. And this is generally becomes more granular in recommendations that there be fair selection and that there's post-trial access. The most recent one is respect for community. And I know this is probably going to be quite um, an important principle for many people in this room. It's the idea that those uh, communities that are going to be affected by, by studies, that there's respect for their right to be involved in decisions that affect them. Now, it's usually operationalized in recommendations that there be authentic, meaningful community engagement and a whole set of practices around that. And we'll talk about that a bit later on in the talk. So these are very powerful. They're probably familiar to you. The issue is they're formulated at quite a high level of abstraction. So you still have to operationalize them in a particular setting to a particular case. Um, you need to specify them in context. You also recognize probably, and you, this probably has come up in some of your debates earlier in the course, that sometimes they're in tension with each other. So uh, uh, an obvious one would be if you look at the first one and the fourth one. So for example, there might be a case where a vaccine team is trying to elicit an informed consent from an individual, but it might be in a cultural context that highly values shared decision-making. So they are highly valuing consultation with spouses and elders, etc. So this is where there are tensions. And again, it doesn't make it impossible. There needs to be a way in which they're balanced. And that's why I've just included just that little picture of a juggler. So you're often trying to balance um, these principles because you really can't switch them off. One person said they always count even if they don't win. So they're always, they're always on the screen, if you like, but they may not be in bold. And that's where um, there needs to be some of the careful work to balance them. So moving to the first issue, and that's that of informed consent. The question really is how can vaccine researchers make sure that they get a, a, a meaningful, authentic, non-tokenistic consent from vaccine trial participants? And I'd just briefly like to describe three recent shifts in the, in the literature around informed consent. The first is away from thinking about consent primarily as a legal indemnification for researchers, although that has a, a, its, its merits. Really rather looking more at how to think about informed consent as promoting sound decision-making in humans. It's essentially what you're trying to do with a consent process, promote sound decision-making. So somebody enrolls in a way that is consistent with their values and preferences after understanding relevant information and the impact on their, on their lives. There's also been a shift away from thinking of informed consent as just a once-off event that happens at enrollment. And now, instead, really trying to think about how to have almost consent to booster sessions across the whole course of a trial where you revisit critical trial concepts, particularly those concepts where the consequences of misunderstanding are severe. So, for example, it might be not understanding the risk of enhancement um, in a vaccine trial. 
or the need not to have behavioral disinhibition where you think you're receiving the products and that it works and therefore you backslide on all the known prevention. So this is really, these are critical things to think about. The other one is moving away from the focus on the consent form only, which is very important. Obviously, there have been really good efforts, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, to reduce the length of consent forms, to reduce the complexity of consent forms, strip out the scientific information, etc. Those are really important efforts. But there's a shift now to try to think more about consent as uh, interaction that happens between the consent counsellor and a prospective participant and really try to think about what are the skills and competencies that you really want in that person who is sitting with another person. So, for example, and you probably know people that are very good at this, but they're either sensitive to, to signs of, of non-comprehension, non-verbal signs of not understanding, or they're sensitive to social desirability where people say what they think you want to hear. So, and they really can create a space with that person to, to go through the consent discussion. A useful model for thinking about informed consent, in my view, is that of the agentic versus conduit model. The agentic model really understands that information that's given by vaccine studies is interpreted by people as active meaning-making agents. They're not blank slates. They often come with a lot of information, some of it incorrect, versus information that can just be sent down the pipe down the conduit, and it's just passively received by people. We, that would be like injecting people with information. And that really doesn't seem to be what happens in an informed consent interaction. The empirical data suggests that there are deficiencies. It's complex. There are deficiencies in understanding. Interestingly, these are not confined just to low resource settings. This happens in all settings. And those two studies are systematic reviews of informed consent interventions. So this is not limited only to low resource settings. There's also data to suggest that what really drives understanding is the consent discussion, hence trying to become much more um, attuned to what is happening in those consent discussions, even efforts to tape them and analyze them and see what happens in those consent discussions, sort of opening the black box of these consent discussions to see what's really happening. In the HIV vaccine trials, which is where I started, uh, there's been a lot of effort to, to be careful about in, uh, how you assess understanding. So there are different methods. You're probably familiar with these. One would just be self-report. Do you understand? Yes or no. Or a checklist. This is a phase one trial, true or false. Or can you describe the purpose of this trial to me? Don't use technical language. Pretend I'm, I'm your mother. Just tell me. So there are different methods. It seems to be that open-ended methods of understanding do tend to generate lower scores. So they're much more conservative. They really seem to get to when, when people don't understand. So uh, it's good to have a mix of methods to try and assess understanding. So moving now on to stakeholder engagement, some important shifts in the literature and in the field, because this is an incredibly rich and uh, fast-moving field in research ethics, but there's been a shift away from thinking of community engagement. So that was what you would have heard maybe five years ago, community participation, community engagement, community involvement. Now people tend to move away from that to talk about stakeholders. So that's a much richer set of role players. So the idea is it is critical to think about communities. That is the people that would live locally around a trial site. They probably mimic trial participants in very important ways. So it is important to engage them. However, it's limited if you are just too community-centric. You need to think a little bit more broadly, and that includes activists. Um, and you'll see in the case study, um, activists are very, very important role play in the case study. Um, but even national regulatory authorities, research ethics committees, journalists, the media, we know how they can describe trials in a way that is, um, you'll wish you had spent more time on engaging them because mopping up afterwards is, is devastating. Um, there's a move also away from just thinking of engagement as giving information. So where you're building people's capacity, you're building their literacy. Really to think much more broadly about other ethical goals. You're really trying to build trust, trying to build acceptance of studies. Um, you're trying to increase the success of, of those studies. You want to try and um, increase the likelihood of the implementation of those results. So a sense of ownership. So the, the, the goals have also become broader. If you look at the right-hand side there, you'll see those international ethics guidelines. All of them deal with community or stakeholder engagement. So there's really been an explosion. 
These are guidance, guidelines on stakeholder engagement in TB vaccine trials, in trials of emerging pathogens like Zika and Ebola. This represents hundreds of pages of guidance, literally hundreds. So what we tried to do was look across the guidelines and think about and try and distill what do ethical guidelines see as excellent engagement? Are there some core thematic issues? And what we found was that ethical guidelines see excellent engagement in three ways. First, it's early and sustained. So it's better to go to people when things are still a moving target than when you're just presenting them with a finished product, because that tends to build a bit of resentment. You need to do it in a sustained way. So what you sometimes see in vaccine trials, not always, is that there's a huge attention to uh, engagement around recruitment and then nothing. And then results dissemination, maybe. Really what you want to see is a steady dosage of engagement across the entire life cycle of studies. Secondly, it's responsive and dynamic, so it's not one size fits all. So the engagement plan that you would do for an HPV vaccine trial with adolescents would be very different from one with intravenous drug users for HIV vaccines. So it's very responsive to, to the context and also quite dynamic, needs to be able to respond to issues in the field. Often there can be unexpected developments, so some vaccine dissidents post a blog and now there's a social media fallout. You really, have, Your engagement plan needs to be able to respond to that. And thirdly, and some people think most importantly, it's broad and inclusive. So you don't want to just focus on community stakeholders and you want to be broad in your, in your approach, a multi-sectoral approach. In TB vaccine trials, they have been writing about an approach using, using a community advisory board. So they establish a dedicated structure. It's multi-sectorial, representative of various interest groups. And it is there to provide advice to the research team throughout the course of the study. And it's bi-directional. They don't just educate communities. They also educate researchers who may have low social cultural literacy. Some of them won't, but many of them will. So they act as kind of a bridge. So there's been some very interesting work on these so-called community advisory boards and TB vaccine studies. So moving now on to access to prevention. This is a very... It can be a very controversial issue. Um, you will all know from the fields in which you work that generally um, the landscape is one of combination prevention. Mm -hmm. So for the condition that the vaccine is trying to target, there are, there may already be existing tools. They're likely to be imperfect, hence the reason for vaccines, um, but they will exist. So there is already this array of tools. You'll also recognize probably from your own settings that for various reasons, participants may not have access to those. So for example, for malaria, there may be insecticide treated bed nets that can prevent malaria, but for whatever reasons, participants or citizens, citizens have imperfect access. Governments can't step up, no one's filling the gap, etc. The issue becomes then, and you will be asked this in the case, is what are the steps that the vaccine study team should take to ensure that participants get access to a known prevention. Some people call this the standard of prevention. Um, and I've kept in for you in italics, the whole range of possible steps. I'm not gonna read them, but they, 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 they go from the very easy and inexpensive, which would just be tell people what's available. So you just tell your vaccine trial participants, you know, there, is, there, are, there are bed nets. Um, you just need to go to that clinic versus much more demanding, complicated, costly steps. For example, arranging some special uh, mechanism to pro provide those to people. So there's a long, a big spectrum. You'll probably recognize, especially those of you with statistical backgrounds, that when the uptake of known prevention tools is high, it can drive incidents down in studies. And they can become more long, more complicated, and more expensive. So that has implications for the budget. That's a budget problem. However, I've been informed that it can be even worse, that sometimes it can make results harder to interpret, and that's a science problem. Um, it can actually compromise the rigor. So how do you tread a middle ground? And this is the most spectacular example of a tension between participants in the here and now and beneficiaries in the future. So this is where it comes really to a head. For HIV vaccine trials, because as you will know, once you contract HIV generally, there's no treating your way out of it, you can't cure it. 
So it's been a very divisive issue, in, unlike maybe for other disease conditions. Um, the latest guidelines take this road. They say that participants must be insured of access to WHO-recommended tools. The minute they're on the list as WHO-recommended, they should become available. However, there can be departures. So good ethical guidelines will often provide reasons for departure, um, for compelling reasons, and that's for scientific, biological, or manufacturing reasons. But this has to be discussed with and accepted by stakeholders, including the Research Ethics Committee. Looking at the time. Wow, if you want to. Okay, ancillary care. So participants you'll recognize do have unmet health needs um, where they may, may reside. They're generally healthy if they're going to be enrolled in a study, but they may have unmet health needs. And in their setting, they may reside in something of a health desert. So they're not getting the health care needs that they, that they need. Very similarly, the issue becomes what steps should, uh, should um, sponsors and investigators take to help. This is the, no, the idea of ancillary care. It's a much abused term. People use the term ancillary care in a way that is not as it is intended. It's intended to be extra scientific care. It's care that has got no part of the scientific protocol. It's just to help. There's a big range of responses. The model that I'm pretty partial to, I've kept it there for you, is that you take more demanding steps uh, when people assume risks and burdens and engage with researchers in a long time frame. And that's because you will be in a setting and you will talk about the ancillary care approach for participants and somebody will say, but what about screen outs? What are you going to do for screen outs? Or they'll say, no, no, what are you going to do for the families, the brothers and sisters and cousins of the participants? You have to have a way to draw these distinctions. And this is a useful model. Ebola vaccine trials have spoken about the importance, if you're going to use the strategy of referral to address ancillary care needs, to really understand what is being referred to, what is the healthcare system of the facility like at the end of that referral, and really take some steps to strengthen it if need be. Payments, I'm not going to spend too much time on, but it is a very controversial and, com and yet very common issue. Guidelines argue pay vaccine participants for their time and their expenses. It doesn't give you a lot of detail, so I've kept a model up here for you, which I personally find extremely helpful. It argues that you pay for expenses. So people are not out of pocket. You zero out their expenses. But you also pay for their time at a, a rate that is similar to unskilled labor. And that's not to be dismissive of research participation, but it's to argue that it doesn't require specialized skills and training. What you generally get here is payments that are quite modest. Um, malaria vaccine trials have argued that it's very important to stay very close to how payment is interpreted in communities that often there can be misunderstandings about what is being paid for. So community members might think that you're not paying for t expenses and time, you're paying for blood or you're paying for risk. So you really need to be very, very careful and uh, have a really community experts that you can harness the expertise and find out what's going on in the, in the community. Um, I see I've only got two minutes, so I'm going to just very briefly talk about coercion and undue inducement because... Yeah, to take your time. Oh, you should, oh, five more minutes. Oh, thank you so much. So when I did this talk last year, virtually, I went over by 15 minutes, which has got to be some kind of terrible record at, for Annecy. So now I'm, I just want to make sure I don't do it. So, so these are two much maligned terms as well. Um, and my, my one request to you would be, if you're going to use these terms, please be precise. And if anyone uses these terms for you, please ask them what they mean. Okay, so coercion, the best way that I think you can think of it, is direct threat of negative sanction. So if somebody says to a vaccine participant, if you don't enroll in this trial, there will be no care for you at the clinic when you come again. That is a coercive statement. Um, and they are fairly easily identifiable. Probably harder to recognize, to identify where people have that misunderstanding, even when people aren't saying it. But coercion is threat. Coercion is not about offers, good things. So if somebody says to you, that payment is coercive, you're going to say, let's talk about the payment, but payment is not coercive. Second one is undue inducement. And this is really where we get into concerns about offers and they're legitimate. So I think undue inducement is best understood as an offered good. So it's some sort of good thing. It's generally excessive. So it seems disproportionate 
And lastly, it has the effect of distorting decision-making. So where vaccine participants don't think about the risks, they discount the risks, they minimize the risks, they devalue the risks. So I think the responses, there are many responses. So complicated issues need multiple strategies. There are many, but I think one of the best is to make sure that when you are providing an offer of any kind, whether it's ancillary care, a prevention package, a payment schedule, that it is carefully justified, which is what we will ask you to do in the case study. Um, right. Let's just see. I've only got, I think, two more slides. So this is the choice of control. This is a controversial issue, and I just wanted to draw your attention to two um, normative, two norms for judging when placebo is acceptable. So you will recognize that generally placebo control is, accept is considered acceptable in a vaccine study when there's no established effective intervention. It may surprise you to know that there are conditions in which it is still considered acceptable even when there is an established effective intervention. Okay, and so in South Africa, we had this for mother-to-child transmission, where we were trying to develop a short course of mother-to-child transmission. There was a longer course available in the US, and the South Africans went with the placebo control. And it was an incredibly divisive ethical controversy. So there are two. Ethical guidelines argue that you can do that under circumstances where there's compelling scientific reasons, and participants will be exposed to a minor increase over minimal risk. If you look at recent advisories, including by WHO, they argue when there's social value, so it's responsive, but when participants are exposed to adequately minimized risks. So there's a difference there. That's a different set of norms. One, the first is arguing that the risks need to be minimal, so they are capped, minor increase over minimal. There's a ceiling there. The other one, there's no ceiling. You just have to minimize those risks and ensure that they are outweighed by social value. Um, and we saw this, there was a, 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 the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics had a whole series on, on this at the start of COVID, what was going to be the acceptable um, approach. So in our final slide is on REC review. And obviously the issue here is how do you promote the competent, independent review of vaccine studies um, by, by research ethics committees? You will recognize that there are probably many threats to, to that, to competent, independent review. The first sort of cluster seems to be around inefficiency, and when you talk to applicants, they will often describe that it's sometimes very difficult to get quick and rapid turnaround. Over COVID and for COVID vaccines, we saw a lot of innovations happening on how to increase efficiency. And I've even spoken with some of you already about some of those innovations. So using electronic systems, moving to a centralized review, even moving to reciprocity of review, where one committee agrees to abide by the oversight of another of another committee. So all of these were trying to increase efficiency without sacrificing quality, because of course that's the problem. You don't want you want to be fast but not shabby. So the second set of of sometimes threats to review is where they're poorly justified conditions. So this might be the case where an applicant writes to the REC and says, "We are enrolling adolescents. We want to use." Uh, parental waiver for the older adolescents. So we're going to use self-consent with opt-in parental involvement if, there's, if the relationship is good. And the IRB says no. So that's hard for applicants when they don't get a, a reason of why that's they're being refused something. Even worse, apparently, is unjustified dif differences where they might um, propose that consent strategy. It's approved by the IRB. And then for a very similar study, the consent strategy is denied. And it's hard to understand what the differences were. So justifications become very, very important. And my recommendation would be, and always is to applicants when they're drafting protocols, is to do a lot of the work for the Research Ethics Committee. So really write your, if you're going to have a consent strategy, you declare it, justify it in terms of ethical guidelines. An approach to ancillary care, set it out, justify. Standard of prevention, payment. Ethics guidelines, the most recent etc. You do that work. And I think that really increases the likelihood that you get engagement with the ethical norms. A good model for to think about is uh, for IRB, in my view, is the reflexivity versus compliance model. In the first one, what you're really trying to do with an IRB is, is partner with them, and hopefully you can surface the ethical considerations together and weigh them up. It's less helpful to think about just trying to comply with a set of very fixed rules set by this authoritarian body. 
I would always argue that you think of the Research Ethics Committee as a stakeholder to be engaged. It has its own culture, its own way of doing things, its own language, its own terrible history of things that have gone wrong. So you really try and understand them and you try and really invest in that relationship. In the case study today, we're going to adopt a centralized model of review. So we'll divide you into seven groups. You will all examine the same issues. Um, and then I will pretend on Monday that I'm the principal investigator and I've heard from all seven of you. And I'll describe to you for each issue what it was like across the issues. Um, and I think that can be really that, that can be a really interesting thing. Thank you so much for the extra time, Carrie. And that's the end of the talk. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Cathy, for a beautiful overview. And uh, the slides are really helpful for the exercise today. Definitely. So please bring your computer to the exercise uh, because it's a very practical exercise. Uh, and uh, you added some very nice advice on how to write the applications to this year. I think they will be helpful for many here. So questions to Cathy, please. Yes. Uh, excellent session. Uh, my question is actually, uh, we are planning to have a trial for the dengue vaccine trial. So yes. similar to the TB, we have also a plan to set up community advisory groups yes. because the follow-up is for two years to five years. Yeah. And it's a very stringent follow-up uh, with uh, about six visits in between for taking blood. And um, uh, every month, every week, first yeah. week, we are having a, 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 a in-person home visit followed by a telephonic visit. So when you said about the informed consent process from a single one time to an ongoing process. Okay. So how, how often do we have to do this ongoing informed consent? Because if I do it too much, they yeah. will get apprehensive and they might pull out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how do I strike a balance and how long? I think with any strategy, whether it's your consent strategy, your payment strategy, the, th the, the thing I would recommend the most is to have a, a, a self-reflective approach. So you don't just implement it, you're going to implement it and then you're going to seek advice from even a few participants and even from the community advisory board. So you're getting that, that outside influence. How are we doing here? Is this having, we're trying to have a positive effect, but is there a backlash? Are we actually now, is there fatigue about this? So it's to really try and just do that to get that feedback. But what I would suggest is you, for informed consent, for the consent booster sessions, the goal that you are uh, trying to achieve, that you're striving for, is to make sure that participants still have a good understanding of the critical concepts. So what you can start to see is if you leave that a bit long, people actually do forget. So you want consent booster sessions to be hit that sweet spot where people um, are perhaps starting to forget certain critical things, and then you come in with, with, with the booster session. Um, but I would always try and seek advice um, about whether it is, and even with assessment of understanding, you want it to be a good thing. You don't want it to be bad. You don't want negative consequences. But as you all know, and if you think in a systems way, sometimes you can um, interact with a system and there can be negative consequences. So just check that out with your cultural advisors and with the community advisory board when you're designing those strategies. So it can be different for different sites, right? Uh, and different uh, for different uh, trials. Uh, in the same yeah. trial, but we have got 20 different sites in yeah. different states of India, yeah. which are absolutely different from each other. Yeah. So the consent process and the it would differ, right? Yeah. I think that uh, I can understand that sponsors who, uh, who want, comp uh, they want there to be harmony, get very twitchy about this. That's why they have master protocols that they don't want anyone to mess with. But I think, so I think uh, in reality, you can have a harmonized, so you can say we are going to plan an approach and you can state it for the master protocol that will involve um, a two-hour consent discussion at enrollment. And then depending on advice from our advisors, um, booster sessions every month with a review at three months to see how we're doing. That could be common. But then, of course, at each site, if you're going to take ethics seriously, that it's in context, there are going to be some little. There are going to be some changes around the edges. That would be what I would suggest. Please, up there. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, yesterday in our group we had some discussion, and I think you could help us sort out this. Uh, we were wondering. So, for example, if I'm doing, let's say, typhoid vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, try F3, uh, let's say in Zambia, and uh, it's not yet introduced in the vaccination program, 
But mm. uh, of course, it's available in Malawi, which is a neighboring country. Mm. So, and uh, so in that case, would I be justified to use a placebo or I would need to use, uh, you know, a vaccine, hoping that perhaps it will be in the EPI program much later? Yeah. So we're wondering what, what, what should be the case. So I think the vaccine would... is available in the neighborhood, but yeah. here where I'm doing the trial, it's not yeah. available. So I might just try to use a placebo or not. I would say you would have to make sure that the decision makers in the country, the National Regulatory Authority and the ILB, looks at the criteria I mentioned on the slide. So you wouldn't just say, should we use this? You've got to say, does it meet the criteria for me to still use a placebo control, even when there is an established effective intervention? So that is a very nuanced discussion. It's about the social value of the study in that setting. So what particular gap is it filling in that setting that you need to proceed with the study? Um, so, and that really requires so much expertise. You really need to have your, your health experts that can tell you exactly what is going to be the value add of this, of the study, why it would have to proceed with the placebo control and no other design. I still think the problem with placebo control, and of course, I'm a country, I come from a country that did do a placebo control trial. It's very, very sensitive for stakeholders. It is extremely sensitive. And the problem is is that that like all exceptions, it can be abused. So you don't want to do that. You want to show in a very transparent way how you have used those criteria. And the the word, the verb there was compelling. And then you are going to, and can you justify that and discuss it in a a very transparent way and let it be um, engaged with and even attacked? How strong is your case? How strong is the case? That would be what I, it's not the easy answer, but I think it's the only answer. Thank you, Cathy. Kamel has a question from one of the quarantine students, and I think we should allow them to be part. So thank you. Uh, this is from John. Um, how do IRBs ca- account for cultural differences? For example, some study populations might have rigid class systems where respecting individual sovereignty of lower class members could be seen as destabilizing of the society. So more specifically, how do IRBs reconcile differences between the listed ethical principles and cultural norms? Yeah. Look, I think that um, there are going to be situations where there are cultural norms. This is obviously the caste system, but I can think of others. Um, where if you enroll a participant using first-person consent, that can lead to social harms for that participant. So the more familiar one would be in a setting where you enroll a woman in a trial, for example, in a normative setting where dis- where husbands make the decision. So um, you'd, here you're trying to adjudicate between respecting the principle and not um, being disrespectful of, of the culture and in causing a backlash to the enrolled participant. I think in those settings, the best you can probably do is design a sensitive consent strategy, be alert to the social harms of using it. So you do need to be able to say to that participant, if we do X, you could face a backlash from your community. This could lead to stigma, discrimination, um, even violence, for example. You try and reduce those risks to a minimum. Of course, the rule of thumb would be if you cannot do that, then it's probably a good idea to consider another setting. But you don't want to do that too quickly. You don't want to say this is so complicated, we can't run a trial here. But at some point, you may have to. So, for example, there are some settings in South uh, in Africa where if you ask a, a vaccine participant certain things about their sexual risk behavior, you will identify behavior that is not just stigmatized, it is criminalized. You can go to jail for that. You can get the death penalty for that. So the idea is trying to make sure that you de- you design a consent strategy and a risk mitigation strategy and accept that in some settings, the cultural norm, the repercussion might be so strong that you might have a bit more success and less damage in another setting. Thank you so much, Kathy. So one last question. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'll do something. So please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Or we can in the US. In terms of, uh, so I once did the trial and, you know, that enrolled, it was global 
but involved certain communities that had an interest also, you know, valid interest of seeing data and having, you know, the right to the data also. But we don't usually do that. So mm-hmm. what what are the rights of participants to have, you know, trials published or have, you know, um, I mean, I guess we, we make trial results, of, like I come from industry, we make trial results available. But, you know, in terms of oftentimes, obviously, results are not being published. Yeah. They're not going to be disseminated. Yeah. So I think there are probably two issues there. The first is the the um, the request by participants and and the, the communities they represent to have access to results. If somebody asked for the, the data, what I would probably do is try and explore what's behind that question. Um, it's a bit like a patient wanting to see their own therapy notes. And and sometimes that actually may not even be helpful because would they be able to interpret the data in any meaningful way? So few people would in the world. So, but there's probably a very, very legitimate request behind the request for the data. And that's probably about not feeling abandoned or used, having some reciprocal access to the knowledge that they helped to generate indispensably. But I would rather focus on doing, making sure that feedback, and this is where international guidelines say, the results really must be palatable and digestible by that community. So you don't just give feedback the way you would to a scientific journal editor. You use your cultural experts and you design three or four messages and you you give results like that. The second issue is slightly more complicated, and that's probably about who owns data and who owns samples. And that's there is really nice guidance and theorems on this under stored data and stored biological samples, just to try and prevent exploitation where the original setting loses access, loses their, their their samples and they go somewhere else. You do need governance structures about that to, with representation from the original setting to make sure that there is return of that data and samples to that setting or at least the sharing of results. And that's sort of more about. Again, it's probably an, a question about exploitation, trying to avoid a, 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 an exploitative transaction. Um, so there are two issues there, if that makes sense. Mm. 